Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization in the global blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastien Couture, and I'm here with Frédéric Ernst. Today, we're speaking with Alex Blania, who is the co-founder and CEO of WorldCoin. But before we talk to Alex, I'd like to first tell you about our sponsors this week. Are your crypto assets sitting highly in your, idly in your wallet? Well, you can start earning rewards and contribute to network security by staking with Chorus One. There is staking providers securing $5 billion in assets on over 25 decentralized networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum. Are you interested in running your own branded nodes? Well, they have a managed white label node as a service offering that leverages Chorus One's highly available and proven infrastructure, enabling you to participate directly in decentralized networks. If you've been a loyal Solana delegator with Chorus One, make sure to check your wallets because they've done their first ever major NFT drop to any validator on Chorus One and they'll be airdropping over 3,600 exclusive NFTs to its Solana delegators, according to their delegation profile in December of 2021. But if you missed out on this airdrop, don't worry because you can still participate in the upcoming airdrops on Cosmos chains by simply delegating to Chorus One notes. So head over to Chorus.One to start your staking journey. We're also brought to you by Paraswap. Paraswap is a DEX aggregator on Ethereum. It means that through Paraswap, you can easily access liquidity on various different decentralized exchanges, the protocol automatically finds the cheapest liquidity for you so you can trade knowing that you're getting the best price. Paraswap also has very is very gas friendly, also helping you keep transactions low. And Paraswap recently added support for Avalanche, Polygon, BSC, and Phantom. You can also use Paraswap directly in your Ledger Live app. In addition to that, they also are becoming DAO. So if you have PSP tokens, that's something you can participate in as a token holder. The Paraswap DAO just voted for the gas refund program. Uh, this allows Paraswap stakers to get 100% gas refund on their trades uh, on the top up of their auto compounding yield. So join Paraswap's Discord channel to learn more about the DAO. Go to paraswap.io slash Discord. Alex, th thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Tell us a bit about your background and how you became involved in crypto and what led you to become the CEO of WorldCoin. All right. So, um, yeah, right before WorldCoin, I was in physics, actually. So I was, um, uh, I, was, I was at Caltech in Los Angeles, and I was working on basically how to use neural networks to make kind of quantum computations that are really, really hard to do uh, with numerical methods, how to make them much, much cheaper and faster. Um, and I did this for quite a while, I think like one and a half, two years. So first in Germany at Max Planck um, and then at Caltech in Los Angeles. And before that, um, well, I was always building things. I was always a hacker, right? So uh, I had my, my first semi company when I was relatively young um, doing vertical farming and many other things. So I was always, I was always building. It was always clear to me that uh, I, I want to kind of start a company um, or, or a project. And yeah, then at Caltech, basically I met Sam and Max back then and uh, heard about Rollcoin, was really excited about it and got involved. Cool. So you met Sam Altman while you were at Caltech? That's correct. Right. So cool. I, the original story actually was something like Sam was already working it together with Max, the, the, the third co-founder. And I don't know, not, not too long, like three, four months. The idea was super early. It was just like the, the concept was there. And I remember actually I interviewed as a as an engineer back then at Rockland. That, that's actually how everything got started. And uh, then I became friends with with both Sam and Max. And uh, the, it was super early, and I just became co-founder. And then I brought my all the great people I met in university, uh, both in Germany at at the Caltech, um, basically with me. And that that turned out to be the founding team. Uh, so we have like a lot of scientists and 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 kind of physicists actually, like many physicists in the company because of that reason. Cool. And what are your respective roles in the project now? Well, I'm the I'm, I'm the CEO. I'm I'm running the day-to-day -day business. All right, the company is now around a hundred people. It's it it's a lot of people because it's just kind of we, we build hardware like on the ground operations, like many things that just require a lot of human capital. Um, and well, Sam is is the co-founder, chairman. Uh, we we talk a lot, and he's involved in every big decision. But I run the day-to-day -day, basically, and. Uh, Max, Max is now actually starting a new project right now. Uh, he's he's like a really great zero to one guy. Cool. So, um, in a nutshell, before we deep dive into the um, Wellcoin itself, um, what's the idea behind Wellcoin? 
So we started um, two years ago, right? So right when I uh, when I came from Caltech, we started with this very simple idea of onboarding the world into Web3 and distribute the value it creates fairly with everyone, uh, because that that itself would be a very powerful thing to achieve. You can you can try and, and achieve many new things with that, like everything from UBI to uh, digital de democracy, all of those things. So that was very, very exciting to us. Um, back then, Web3 was not a common word used. Back then, it was just crypto, and uh, very few people participating, and we just really thought hard about how can we accelerate this whole transition, like how can we get many, many more people into there, uh, because getting to a large network and just kind of getting much more attention towards it should should be net positive for everyone. And so with that idea, we we thought about just launching a token by by giving ownership in that token to everyone, just just simply for the reason of being a human. Just like when, when you no matter where you are, who you are, you should you should have access to that and, and claim ownership in that in that token. Um, and that then should be hopefully the widest and fair distributed token there is currently, right? And that was a very simple basic idea. And then we stumbled across a, uh, a very big problem that I think you, you talk about here quite a bit. I, I heard it from uh, from Gitcoin recently is, is civil resistance, right? Like how can you how can you make sure uh, that that every participant in, in such a in such a network in such a system is only receiving one uh, one one share of it and it's not just creating multiple pseudonymous identities and basically the whole mechanism breaks down um, and that's why we uh, that's why we're building a hardware device uh, called the orb so the, the the orb is just basically the the only solution we found um, to solve that problem in a privacy preserving and scalable way how every user can prove to the protocol not our not not just ours but everyone else's uh, that they are in fact unique real alive and uh, yeah, so fundamentally it's two things. It's a, it's a platform, it's open, decentralized, proof of personhood that any other project will be able to use for whatever they want to use it for, and then an application of that platform which will be the widest and fairly distributed token there is. That, that is the idea. And um, yeah, right now we, we have answered all the big conceptual and technical questions we had a year ago. Uh, we have onboarded, I think, 450,000 people. So we're ready to scale. It's a really exciting time in the company. So before you came up, with this sort of final idea of the orb and we'll get into how the orb works. What had you imagined other systems that would allow you to overcome the civil resistance problem? Um, you know, or had you looked at other uh, civil resistant uh, protocols and other initiatives that people are working on to try to solve this problem? Um, and you know, how, how did those come up short if, you know? Yeah. A lot, uh, so many many months actually. So the first, I don't know, I probably like the first four or five months, we just we just thought about this problem and kind of read in all of those different things that are that are out there right now. That there's, there's like many things, right? It starts with classical KYC that you could use, and that's obviously not great for um, a bunch of obvious reasons. Then what many people are doing is, is web of trust or network topology things where you just try to analyze the network of users and you try to understand, okay, who, who of those people are fraudulent users and all those kinds of things. Um, and basically the the summary of that back then was that the only truly scalable thing that there is currently is um, is biometrics. It's just a fundamental solution to that. It's like you, you take a feature that is unique to a person um, and you use that to make sure that that person signs up only once, right? And um, that that's the case, for example, in India and in the Adhar project. If you want to be part of the social buffer system in India, you do that also with your with your biometrics. Uh, that's the only solution they found to that problem. Um, and the cool thing in crypto is you can use zero knowledge proofs to make it privacy preserving. So that was that was back then this big click moment for us where we looked in all of those other things, um, and none of that really seemed to scale. Or we saw many many reasons how at scale, so if it goes above like 100 million, 200 million, 500 million users, um, it would break down. Um, and that was not the case for biometrics. And then we we realized, okay, if you use your knowledge proofs in the right way here, you can actually make it privacy preserving, you can make it scalable and, and practical on a, on a global application. But we really think about it as like we're not, it was a really tough insight to be to be clear. It was nothing we we have been excited back then. Like, okay, we have to build our own hardware device. So cool. It was a really 
um, brutal uh, kind of insight for us. It, it's it's obviously a very hard endeavor, and we really see it as we try to innovate on all the other things that there are in parallel, right? And we try to bootstrap a large net enough network with the orb as fast as we can, and then maybe at some point uh, we we can switch to Web of Trust or other applications, or the orb continues to stay in, in other applications. We will see, but basically we think about this problem a lot, and uh, it's it's the cleanest and, and straightforward solution we found. So I, I kind of want to talk about um, the problem set and the process of collecting biometric data in a bit. But maybe let's talk about the orb first. So the orb is this very futuristic looking ball, um, ball-like thing. It's, it's shiny, it's made from metal, and it photographs your iris, right? Yeah. Um, and what what does it then do with um, the the iris scan? There are actually there are multiple things to that, right? So first of all, what is the problem you're trying to solve? The problem is is called proof of of personhood or or proof of unique humanness, right? So how can anyone, no matter where you are, where you come from, you can prove to a protocol that you are in fact unique, you are a real human, and you're alive. So you're not. You're not a bot. You're not a display that tries to like a attack the system in any different way. Like all kinds of security concerns, of course. Th that is proof of personal. That is proof of unique uh, humanness. And so, what the orb does is it um, first kind of has all kinds of security me mechanisms in there to check that you are in fact a real person versus a display and all kinds of things, right? Because basically, you want to show up in front of that orb and a few seconds later you get your proof of person that should not work with a display or all kinds of contact lenses all those kinds of things so first the orb does a liveness check um, to make sure that you're real uh, then it collects a, a picture of your eye uh, calculates a unique identifier out of your, your your eye so the muscle of the eye that's actually uh, kind of we will we'll talk more about biometric um, data sources in a second, but basically it's the only thing that actually works. Fingerprints, face, does all of that stuff doesn't work. And then basically proves to uh, to an L2, so those iris hashes, for, first of all, from, from the iris embedding, there's an iris hash created, so you cannot go back from that actual hash to the picture of the eye, that, that's the first important piece. And then the iris hash is stored on an L2 in the open, so everyone one can see what is going on there. And the user can then prove or foresee knowledge proof in their app um, that they are included in a certain set of people. So basically, basically the thing that you achieve here is the orb proves, or with the help of the orb, you prove that you are unique in a certain set of people without revealing who you are and what your actual public and private key is. So you, you stay fully pseudonymous and neither us or anyone else can change that. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. So basically, if, um, if I scan my iris again, um, it'll come up with um, the same hash um, and you'll know that I'm already in the system and it will deny um, a new proof of personhood, right? Correct. So where do you store, um, wh where's your database of iris hashes? So there, there's like a, there's a roadmap we will publish around that soon. But um, the final state of the system is that it's stored on another L2 Right, so on another blockchain, uh, or those, those iris hashes are stored, and so so it's in the open. There is no central database or something like that, uh, and everyone basically can prove that that uh, that verification happened. Okay, interesting. So so I, I think there's been a, a number of criticisms around around this uh, around the system. Um, and I think the the one that I, that most people have that I've read and like most people have cited is this idea that once you've created a hash of your biometric data, uh, there's no going back, and that that hash of your biometric data can be used for any number of um, any number of applications. You know whether it's um, you know targeted ads or it could be something even more nefarious. Um, how how like how did you guys come to this to the conclusion that this was in fact a good idea given the the amount of and you know it's possible that this uh, skepticism exists in 
a certain circle of the population. I think that most people in the world, you know, don't think about this sort of thing the same way that most people don't use Signal or, you know, like don't use a ledger device or uh, don't go to great lengths to, you know, um, stop tracking or like things like that. Um, but from your position of understanding these things, he's like, you're a smart guy. Uh, how did you how did you square uh let's say you know the the application which is you know fairly powerful of like being able to prove someone's personhood with this is actually a good idea and no harm will come of this right so so first of all um we are actually quite like our, our team is very extreme on the privacy side we have like many many people that have the background in the company so we we think about that a lot and we don't take that lightly, right? So, but it is very important to understand that what those zero knowledge proofs here achieve really is that your your biometrics do not end up being your your actual identity, but rather your your kind of password, right? So those two things are fully separate. I as a user, I show up in front of an orb, um, I verify my proof of person, that I basically receive two set of keys, one one set of public and private keys for my actual wallet, my Ethereum wallet, and I can do whatever I want with that. And then the second thing is my basically identity um, public and private key. And I can use that to then issue with zero knowledge proofs to different applications that I'm unique to that application, right? So basically whenever, uh, I don't know, let's go to the worst case. I don't know, like we, we actually would try to, to track people or something like that uh, or, or anyone else really. The only thing we could we could we could prove or anyone else can prove is that you're unique to that application. You end up in a place where I have no idea who you actually are, and that's what you want to achieve. Right? So in fact, I think it's much more privacy preserving than anything we use in our daily lives, like a Google login or a Facebook login or something. So it's just really, really important to understand the implications of zero knowledge proofs and that implication and why it's why it's so powerful. Right? That that is that is, I think. That is the important takeaway, and we will just explain it over and over. We will open source everything so people can actually, they do not have to trust us. They can just look what's actually going on. Uh, and then I think it will be it will be clear and it will be fine. Uh, because, of course, if other people have better ideas how to solve that problem on scale, uh, we will be the first ones to go to, down, that, down that path. Uh, but at this point, we don't see anything. So the person who kind of, or the, the organization that kind of decides whether a hash is unique enou uh, uh, enough. Basically, th that's kind of um, uh, what in a legacy world would be the attestation server, right? So basically the, the place where you check um, that something is... Ha so how does that work if it's just a list of hashes on, on a layer two? Well, so the attestation uh, happens in the public, right? So basically uh, the, the orb... So, so, so the orb um, re records an image, the orb uh, calculates an embedding, hashes that embedding, uh, signs a message with uh, both that embedding and kind of the, the, public, uh, the public identity private key and sends it to the attestation L2 and the comparison happens there. And basically what happens there is a distance metric, right? So you, have a, you, have, um, you, you basically have a code of numbers, a set of numbers, they get compared to each other. If that distance is, is close enough, you say, okay, that person has already verified, has signed up before. Uh, and if that's the case, it gets inserted in a, in a Merkle tree, right? And th that's, that's the set of unique people. Okay, but only ops can um, append uh, to that um, list of attestations. I mean, in the beginning, it it would be cool if we as a community figure out ways how uh, other people can can build their own hardware uh, when we actually open source all of the designs and, and, and things like that. It's just a hard hard thing to solve, of course, but I'm pretty sure we will get there. So by, by open sourcing the software, will, will that provide... Because I, I think one of the things that people have been concerned about through you know, reading like on Twitter, etc., is that the the hardware is actually doing things that um, it's not supposed to. So like that the hardware is acting maliciously. That perhaps like the, that Worldcoin has a potential to be sort of commandeered by like a government actor or something like that to actually scan irises. These are sort of like conspiracy theory style scenarios, but like scenarios that people are concerned about. 
by open sourcing the hardware, I see that like I can see that you know that would allow people to peer into what the code has been instructed to do, but without access to the actual hardware that um, that people are using sort of in the street, there's no way to actually verify um, what the hardware is doing. I guess like I'm curious what I'm curious if if you have a nightmare scenario, you know, like. What is your nightmare scenario and what are you doing to mitigate it? Okay, so so first to react to your your, your comment, I, I do not worry that people will take that orb apart relatively fast. Um, so like we have we will open source everything, we we will we will build in the open with the community, so we will have absolutely no incentive to do something like that. Um, I think actually the the real concern I have is that I don't know, like malicious people try to build their own orbs and make them look like orbs, right? And, and try to, I don't know, fool fool users into believing, okay, you're actually signing up for Brooklyn right now, but you're signing up for something else. I think that is the that is the absolute worst case that could happen here. Um well it will just not work with the with, with the Rollcoin app or all the other apps that actually support Rollcoin onboarding. So uh you, you will have to build your own app and whatever. And that's that's a fraud case of course. Uh, and what will need to happen here is just being very, very transparent and very educational around all of those things, right? I think that's that's a problem that everyone sees and expects. Um, yeah, that that that's by far the, the the worst case we think about. What do you think about? Yeah, that, that I think that's what I also had in mind. Like, you know, it, it's a fraud case, of, like you said. I mean, there's no stopping anyone from doing that. Uh, you know, just like there's no, no one can stop someone from like selling you some bullshit cryptocurrency and masquerade, you know, pass it off as something else or so, so I think there's some amount of irrational fear around this and, but there's also a good amount of rational fear around unknown unknowns. And, and I guess I think that's the thing that most people are concerned with when, um, when it comes to privacy, when it comes to their data, when it comes to things like DNA sequencing or any sort of um, any sort of biometric data, you know, like I, I got a DNA kit for for Christmas, and um, and you know, I like I thought long and hard about whether or not I wanted to do it, and I, and, and I ended up like sending it back because I didn't like because there's too many unknown unknowns. Like I, I know a lot of the known risks but there's just some unknown ones that i i, I can't um square with um and i think that this this um uh, way of of uh mitigating civil, res civil resistance hints at a little bit of that as well i mean yeah obviously i totally i totally understand that part all uh, right I, like i have the same emotion towards many things i use in my daily life um and i don't know like it actually starts with with using Google and and what's not right there. There's I, I know that somehow it's probably not a great idea, um, but it just makes my life easier. Um, but I, I think what will happen here, since we we will open source everything, we will build with the community. Is I don't know. We we can we can figure out the unknown unknowns. Like we are not a we are not a closed source company that that do things behind doors or something, um, at least w once we put everything out, which by the way, is just really, really hard to do with hardware. It's we, we hear that criticism of like, why, why didn't you do it so far? Um, well, because the, 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 at, at some point the, the cost of attacks was higher than the rewards, but we will do it relatively soon in the next weeks. So yeah, I totally, I totally get that point. Uh, but I think it, in my consideration and our thinking, and we thought about this problem for quite a while, uh, it is privacy preserving. It truly is, like just by design, by the by the use of, of the zero knowledge proofs that we, we we're doing here, right? And um, neither us or anyone else will be able to do by design of the system uh, kind of really really scary things. And that's the most important thing to get right. And then there's of course many things we have to figure out together with the community. Um, many things I probably don't think about at this point. I think you're right about that part, of course. But I I cannot give you like a great answer here because. I think you're right, uh, and I think we have to figure out those things together. I think civil resistance is one of the biggest problems of that space is unsolved. Uh, everyone knows that, and that is a way forward. All right, and let, let's try to get it to work. 
Yeah, so maybe let's um, put the biometric um, thing behind us. I'm also queasy about this, but um, let's let's talk about the protocol. So basically, um, what technology is it based on? And I mean, if you plan to onboard the first billion users with this, how is it going to scale? Right. So the the token itself is um, the the token is minted as an L2 on top of Ethereum, an optimistic rollup. We're using at this point at least Hubble from the Ethereum Foundation, and we put a lot of resources to make it even more gas efficient. So we we, we make our high our own sequence implementation and things like that. Um, and the reason here is just make it very gas efficient. Uh, but we will allow and we are working on this right now, um, users to mint the token on other ecosystems too, like Solana, for example, right? Um, just because we want to be ecosystem chain agnostic, the whole protocol should should be like that. So the, the proof of person itself, of course, should be able to be used by people no matter which, which ecosystem, if it's near Solana, Ethereum, whatever. Uh, it's just a very powerful primitive that should be open. So um, basically, I have an attestation on each um, chain I choose to interact on, um, and then how does it how does it connect me to my account? So, so first of all, we are using um, for this for this whole zero knowledge proof part, we're using what is called Semaphore, uh, also from 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 Barry Whitehead from the Ethereum Foundation, right? So that is w with that you can you can prove. Uh, uniqueness or kind of inclusiveness in a set or not uh, without revealing your your actual private key. That, that is what you want to do here. Uh, and yeah, so that, that semaphore from the Ethereum Foundation we're using right now and we will re-implement that, uh, for example, on Solana. Because basically what is happening is there, there's a Merkle tree uh, and you use your knowledge proofs to kind of create that nullifier um, on, on your phone. So... That will be the hard part, uh, re-implementing those things on, on other ecosystems too, but right now it's on Ethereum. Um, so there's two sets of uh, public-private keys, right? So basically, what happens if I use if, if I lose my, I mean, I'm not going to lose my iris, but uh, hopefully, uh, but uh, uh, what happens if I lose my phone? Well, that's, uh, I mean, so, so your normal e Ethereum public-private key is just, the, the app will have an iCloud backup, right? That for, for that part, uh, maybe we will implement other things like social recovery. I think you're aware that's just a problem the whole e e ecosystem has. Uh, that's the hard part for the if you lose your your kind of semi. It's actually the semaphore key. It's not not like a normal um, public private key. But if you lose that part, theoretically you could show up uh, in front of an orb. You need another information too for that. Uh, like the phone number or something like that, but we do not have that implemented. So right now, the simplest answer is you you lose your your identity at this point, and there's things we have to implement in the future for that. I had a question here. Just it, it, would it be possible? Because I mean, like the I think what's important to realize here is that the onboarding and the um, the issuance of this semaphore um, kind of coupon. Um, is separate from the actual wallet and uh, then like holding and movement of funds. Um, would it be possible for any Ethereum wallet to like if I want to use, I don't know, like my ledger or if I want to use Zengo or anything that's like wallet connect compatible, could I not just use any uh, other wallet? Sure. Yeah. Like it, it will even be like even the onboarding to Rollcoin will be will be possible through other wallets, right? So um, we have an app, of course, like we're building our app ourselves uh, because it's just like in the first realization is onboarding people in, I don't know, all over the world at the same time is really, really hard. Like trying to people onboard in, in, in Kenya with, with MetaMask doesn't go that well. Um, let me tell you that. So that that's why we're just building also an app that makes all of that much, much easier. But everything is open and other other apps can integrate even that onboarding. Um, so let's talk about um, onboarding and incentives. So basically you actually give people tokens for signing up, correct? That is correct. Um, so what? How, how many tokens do people get? How much is that worth? And um, is that a one-time thing? So um, th there's actually something, something new coming up here. Um, but 
basically what happens is use a user when you sign up for for rollcoin you receive rollcoin tokens so you get ownership in, in the network and the protocol um that that also will have governance rights all of those things right and we are experimenting with different incentive mechanisms right now like how much how much rollcoin do you actually uh, will you give out at different times of the system? All of those different things. But in short, uh, there will be 10 billion tokens in total. It will be a capped supply system. 8 billion of those will go to users. And you will have to implement something like early users get more because the kind of if it actually gets adopted, the protocol gets adopted more and people are using it, the, the price will increase right, to some degree. So early users will receive more tokens to still make it worthwhile for them. Uh, but I think what actually will be really exciting to see and what I guess we will see relatively soon is that other projects will also do airdrops uh, through the Rollcoin network, right? It's basically like this this billion user table that Balaji is always talking about, um, or, or at least mention it often and, and send this blog post around, right? It's, it's like, it will be an open database of unique humans uh, that you can just, I don't know, distribute ownership in different things towards too. So my guess is relatively soon, users will not only receive Rollcoin, but other tokens too. So the public narrative um, around Webcoin kind of is centered around this UBI notion. Um, and basically to me, something that is um, given out once is uh, is kind of, it's an airdrop, it's not a UBI, right? So basically a UBI would be something, an income that you actually um, get on a regular basis. Sorry, I, I probably thought a little bit too complicated here. Um, so yes, use a user, you will receive your Rollcoin as a gradual unlock, right? That that has many that has many different reasons. So I don't know. Let's say you receive 100 Rollcoin, you will receive those 100 Rollcoin over two years, uh, and like a, a small piece of it every week. Yeah, I mean, like, why we are so excited? I mean, uh, we like both Sam and I. We are just personally really excited about UBI, or or at least something like that. Uh, will be the question how it actually is built in detail in the future but when ai and, and and kind of agi comes closer we will need something like that um but i don't know there's just how much how much money do you need to give away so rollcon will do a, a part for that but we we cannot solve the problem our own like other people will need to jump in and use that that proof of personal layer to do their part as well like not not one single entity can provide ubi to the whole world of course so with, with with a fixed supply, um, like how, how long how long until this uh, initial supply of Worldcoin is exhausted? So like we, we we shouldn't expect that like in two generations from now people are still onboarding with the orb, with in the hopes of getting Worldcoin. They might onboard with an orb device or something similar in order to prove their identity and have access to you know all all of the sort of additional services and things that. Uh, people get by proving their identity, but they're not going to be issued the the world coin, right? Right. It it depends really on how the um how, how the price develops over time and, and things like that. But it it really is designed with the thought that everyone should be able to claim a share of it, right? So uh, the later you come, you will you will get less, but it, it should bring us to three three to five billion people at least, uh, and if everything goes right, more more than that. Yeah, but, but I mean, like, let's let's imagine like a, you know, uh, best case scenario, uh, uh, you know, seven people on board, seven million, uh, seven billion people on board in the next uh, five years. And then like, there's just like, there's always new people, like there's, there's always people being born every day. Uh, so if we have like all the world's population, then plus uh you know like mothers are putting the orb in front of their newborn babies in order to get you know their world coin tokens um at, at which point does the supply get exhausted well we will see what the community comes up with uh right like there there's a total total reasonable case to like i don't know like drop drop a new a new coin whatever maybe the community votes to expand the supply all of those things like Right now, that's the problem we solve. If we if we get to that um, to that limit, that's already a big big th big deal, of course. And then it should be commonly owned. Okay, so governance could at some point uh, increase the supply. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Like all of that, all of that stuff is not figured out. We also will figure it out together with the community. But um, that would be that would be cool to do. 
So in addition to people getting wild coins for signing up, um, people who sign them up, so the op operators, also get tokens, right? That's correct. But they have to buy their op up front. So, so basically, they're kind of renting it from the protocol. Uh, that, that that will be the final state, right? So, you 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 will probably have to stake some amount of roll coin. You will receive an orb, and you you can use it, and then uh, you will earn a sign every reward in roll coin for every for every person you onboard, or uh, yeah, or, or re-identify. There's a lot of things going on here, actually. Um, we, we will also publish a quite long blog post later on because there's fundamentally in kind of this whole incentive mechanism is kind of the, the crux of the problem. That's, that's the core of the problem. Like if you, if you really come to a place where the incentives of everyone is aligned, or like, of course, like the, the big ones, like the, 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 the team, the community, uh, investors, uh, operators, users, like if all incentives are well aligned, so for example, operators have an incentive to um, onboard only users that are actually kind of really understanding what is going on and really are using uh, what, whatever they're getting, they should earn more rewards, uh, for example, things like that. So you, you want to have all of those mechanisms built in. That's why it's quite a, quite a complicated thing. In short, they receive an orb, they rent it from the protocol, and they earn some rewards depending on uh, how good they're doing. And again, the community the governance will, will change the parameters depending on different countries and what's or not, but that's the short answer. So you guys have been have been publicly accused of running um, a multi-level marketing scheme with um, the OPS. <laughs> what what's your reply to that? I don't know. Like pe people people will say many things at at some point. It's it, it is just not the case, right? And um, it was really funny. That, like on on Twitter, there was this this early uh, team video. From like the growth team or something where they explained real kind of whatsoever and, and people m made jokes about that but back then we literally have been like five people a team of five people or like eight people um sitting in a small apartment in, in san francisco and, and figured things out All right so like we were a startup we we're testing many things uh and many things will not work others will and we, we will we will move ahead All right so um but but of course like to be very very clear we will produce fifty thousand of those devices a year Right, so, and that starts relatively soon. So that means uh, every month we will onboard thousands of new people with those orbs. Um, and already now we have onboarded 450,000 users to Rollcoin, and that's only the case with 30 devices. So one device is onboarding an average of 800 people a week. Uh, the best ones are doing more than 2,000. So the numbers are much, much crazier than we thought in the beginning. Um, but on the other hand, the implication of that is that just operational load of handling that is insane, right? Like uh, figuring out the governance, making sure the operators are doing the right things, are not ex explaining like shady things. All of those, all of those problems that you get on scale, um, right? That, that even things like Uber and whatever had in the early days, we have to figure that out. But we have to figure that out in a decentralized way in the open, which is even harder, I guess, for that case. So yeah, it's it will be a big challenge, and I think um, people will make fun of many things, and that's fine uh, as long as we we move forward and we actually. Get it, get it going. So I'm curious, who are these 450,000 people? Where are they mostly concentrated? And like, yeah, what's what's the kind of demographics of the people that you're onboarding right now? I know you had, uh, I know you had some onboarding, some people in France. Like I live in France, I know you had some some people with an orb here. Yeah, oh, that's cool. Okay, so like, first of all, what was the objective, right? Like the over the last few few months. Um, the objective really was just talking to users in as many locations as, as we possibly can and kind of figure out what do they understand, what do they not understand, um, what works in terms of operators, incentive mechanisms, all of those things. So we really like, we were like full on in testing mode. And so that means we, we, we took a small number of devices, only 30 of them, uh, because the media attention is just really high. It's like a shiny thing that shows up in, in front of, I don't know, like in a big, big city um, that, that attracts a lot of attention. So small number of devices, and then we try to spread them as, as, as much as we can all over the world. So everything from Norway, people have operated them in Troms or Norway, like in like, I don't know, mi minus 10 degrees Celsius. And then the orb broke down to um, everything, like to, to Cape Town, um, Chile. So really all over the world, um, I, I could show you, I guess we do not have video sharing here, but I, I could show you a map. It's, it's really all over the place. 
everything from Europe to Africa, Indonesia, India, uh, Chile, uh, and quite quite evenly spread. But the the thing you you learn relatively fast, um, which was surprising to me, is that the biggest the biggest thing to figure out will be to find the right operators, and you really want to find kind of young entrepreneurial people that otherwise would run companies. So kind of this this YC application process. That's really how we think about it because you have a strong Pareto distribution going on here. The most productive ones onboard like many many more people because, for example, in Kenya, one operator uh, led the the local crypto club and then started people onboarding in universities where like the the the, the crypto user density is really, really high. So in, in short, smart operators will figure out uh, things that no centralized entity could ever do. And that, that, is, that is why we're doing that, right? Like find sm smart, young, talented people all over the world. They will find how to explain people Web3 and onboard them into it. Is that a tangible upside um, for the people receiving WorldCoin today? I mean, is it tradable? No, it's not. It's um, so, so right now in the in the testing phase, users receive uh, IOUs and Rollcoin that will go online when the mainnet goes live. Um, so so that that is what. I imagine that's difficult to explain to people. I mean, so basically, um, for Web three users, I mean, this is this is something that we're used to. But if you go um, to Nairobi and say, uh, please look, please look into this. Oh, no, you don't need to smile. Um, sort of thing. That's, um, I mean, what, what do you tell these people why they should do this? Yeah, of course. You, you're, you're, you're saying it exactly right. It's, it is different and that's why it's, or it's, it's difficult and that's why it's actually so cool that it, that it already works. Like all of that, the whole last year. Uh, and again, we will publish much more about this, but the whole last year was super surprising to us, um, just like the scale, how it works. And w what those stories, those operators tell is very, very different, right? So for example, I don't know, when you when you interview users in Kenya and in in those universities, it's about um, Web3, uh, kind of Rollcoin will hopefully soon be the, the widest distributed and, and fairest network and you get ownership in it before it actually goes live. And just, I don't know, like, Young, young people find that cool and exciting. And then you also receive your proof of person that later on, if people actually start building things with it, you can use for that. So it, you're right. It's like uh, those operators, they uh, do a long pitch uh, and in, in many places because it's hard to explain. But what will happen relatively soon is that Rollcon will become a platform um, for other projects and protocols to also distribute their ownership because that's that was actually a quite recent change we're really, really excited about is kind of we want to bring the community with us and not, not, not only our tokens, other people should be able to do that too. And I think we will see that relatively soon. How do you police operators? So basically, I mean, if, if the operators have a much um, clearer picture of what the possible upsides um, of uh, the token are, how do you prevent them from saying, um, look, I don't really want to explain this, but I'll give you $2 if you look into this op? For, first of all, right now, operators receive, they not re they're not receiving Rollcoin IUs, they're receiving um, stable coins uh, paid by us, right? That, that is the case right now. When, when, when the money goes live, they will be paid by the protocol. How much do they get per person? I do not have the exact numbers in, in, in mind because it's different for different locations. Later on, there will be, again, like a community-governed auction mechanism basically going on to find the right price, given on how the market goes. Uh, and, and right now, we just try to estimate, okay, what is the opportunity cost for someone to, I don't know, work an hour in Norway and work an hour in in, uh, in, in Cape Town, and you you try to cover that. And you you understand, okay, how many signups do those people make? Uh, and that is everything from $1 to uh, like up to five dollars per sign up depending on where you are i think that that's roughly the range but I, I can check it up and let you know later and to your question actually you 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 asked one of the most important questions um which is like how do you align the operators incentives with the ones of the of the protocol right so um in the extreme case you could imagine an operator going or showing up in i don't know let's take as an example like an elder, elderly home like people that have absolutely no idea what crypto is and the operator goes in there and signs up all of the people because that's just the easiest way to earn a reward right um so what you, what do you have to do and that's a hard thing to do so you, you basically have to uh, measure 
kind of a quality metric in, in, in some way, right? So, and, and these are many things, right? Like users afterwards answering kind of governance questions, like how much do they actually understand what is going on? That's the easiest thing you can do. Then afterwards, okay, do they actually transact with the protocol and things like that? Because all of that also has to work decentralized, which makes it even harder. And then what you want to do is you want to have a feedback mechanism to the operator. So operator earns more if uh, the user actually is an active user and, I don't know, answers the governance questions in the right way. And that should be much more because then those operators, they go to, to crypto uh, conferences and not to, uh, I don't know, like whatever, an elderly home in the extreme case. So, so that is a really hard thing to figure out. And uh, to be clear, like one of the hardest things and really did not work in the beginning. So we, we saw all of those all of those cases happening. Uh, we, we saw it happening, for example, in, in one occasion that like an operator onboarded people without phones um, because we did not have like this feed, feedback mechanism implemented. And that, that's of, of course not great, but that's because why we're doing testing. I'd like to talk about the WorldCoin, like the company and sort of the organizational structure. So I, I think WorldCoin is a US based company in San Francisco, but can you talk a little bit about the corporate structure? Will there be a foundation? What does that look like? Yeah, so I, I will tell you where we are right now, um, but but there are still many things to figure out. Um, like, and I actually would love to brainstorm with you if you have great ideas. But so right now uh, there is there is a a US entity like a, a normal company. Um, we have we have people based in the United States. Okay, actually, so there is a US entity, there is a German entity, and then there is a Swiss foundation. So these are the things that currently exist. And why why that is the case is we have um, we have a team in in the United States, but that's that's actually very small at this point. Uh, most of the people are uh, in Europe, and there's this very funny backstory. It's like we we actually ended up in a small town in the middle of Germany um, <laughs> because in uh, during COVID we we were building hardware devices, like we had to go to an office, and we really started. Uh, Rollcoin in January before COVID started. So like in March, COVID hit. In January, we started working on it. And it was really hard in San Francisco to go to an office or to a lab even to build things. The, the regulations were just super strict. And some of us, including me, had German passports. So just we flew everyone from San Francisco to to the small town called uh, Tenenlohe next to also a small town, Erlangen, and <laughs> rented a big place there, uh, rented like houses around it, um, and and just like flew everyone in there, and we just had had crunch time for like many weeks. Uh, so, anyways, that's why we're still here. We have like a lot of hardware equipment, um, and it kind of became a meme in the company. Right. So many people in Germany, some of them in San Francisco, and there's there's a Swiss Foundation now. Yeah. So the Swiss Foundation should do the token issuance later on. Um, the the thing I'm trying to understand right now, and maybe you have like good input here, like good ideas, is um, how to actually kind of set up the DAO structure in the right way, right? Like, so right, right now there's a company, it's called Tools for Humanity, but obviously like this meme I, I saw many times on Twitter directed towards me, like if your currency has a CEO, it's not a, like, it's not a cryptocurrency and all of those things, right? Like we understand that that's not the, not the goal. So we want to figure out a way, like how we can give as much governance as we can to the community and, and kind of put the legal, legal structure behind that. But that's, that's still in the works. Cool, and um, Alex, you're VC backed. So um, last year you actually um, raised 25 million at a valuation of uh, 1 billion from uh, the uh, f from the crypto all star. So a a a Z Coinbase Ventures, Coin Fund, SBF, and so on. Let's talk about the business model of WorldCoin. So in 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 a way, um, you've reserved 20 percent of the WorldCoin tokens um, for um, investors and developers so basically insiders right yeah i mean no no, no. um so, so how it's actually structured is 10 percent to the foundation and 10 percent to to investors broadly specified so right now these are just internal investors like as you said like vcs um but again we, we're trying to find a way how to broaden that investor base soon but um more about it later so yeah, that, that's the case. Okay, and um, so how does this um, square with um, uh, 
the mission of a fair launch. So basically, if you say basically everyone, um, basically this this um, cryptocurrency, um, the value proposition is basically that it's as widely um, distributed as possible, and then basically twenty percent is retained by a very small. I mean, but you know. But compared to you know the entire world population by a very small set of individuals, um, how how does this square up? Well, I mean, it's um, so, so. First of all, I I think as you as you probably know, compared to other projects, it's actually a very very small fraction, right? So it's um, it, it's basically as far as we we thought we can go in terms of just giving it to users in the community but while still funding the project, right? We just have a simple economic question. We see, like in, in a regulatory world, we live today, um, the best way to get capital to build something like that are VCs. And uh, I know it's like an anti-meme in the crypto space, actually like Chris Dixon and, and people like that we're working with are some of the smartest people I know. So I'm actually really, really happy to have them. So um, yeah, and then you just make a calculation. And I'm really flattered that at this point in time, like everyone says, like it's crazy, like whatever, twenty percent. But when we have been ten people in, in in the middle of the bear market in San Francisco, uh, it it sounded like an insane endeavor, and everyone gave us the feedback back then, like you will not make that work. You will have to uh, kind of give, uh, kind of do more pre mine, otherwise you will not be able to fund it. And we really sticked with it and. Trust me, it was a really, really tough thing to do, and it will be an even tougher thing to do in the future because uh, building hardware and, and being on the, on the global scale, it just requires capital. And um, it's a hard discussion. We have it over and over. So, like, of course, Twitter and the community thinks like it's 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 a lot. Investors think that like it should be more. Uh, so that's that that's the trade of you're navigating. And um, yeah, if people have better ideas, what we can do, uh, I would love to hear them. Uh, but just giving the situation you launch a company today you cannot do ICOs as you could in, in the early days you have to get funding for that it's like what what are other options do you have that's that's the question and because fundamentally what you where you want to end up um, right like all incentives should be and will be aligned around the token not around a company that's the other important boundary condition right like we do not want to sell IP or, of an orb or like I don't know see people building I don't know using those or for or like selling that the iris gang technology or like whatever that all of that stuff is off the table right all of that ip goes in the foundation so all incentives are landed around the token and that's why you have to have that that allocation reserved does it make sense yeah and then that, i think it makes sense i i think um there's examples and i think the hard, the fact that you're doing hardware makes it particularly unique because there's there's an added cost there that you know if you don't have if you're just a software project um but like if you look in the cosmos community for instance I, i'm citing this example because i'm like close to that community you know projects are raising funds from foundations um from um, you know, sort of like uh, grants programs and, and things like that. And they're, they're able to launch their projects um, and launch the token without, uh, you know, like massive, um, like sort of VC backing. Like in your case, it's, it, it's obviously difficult, different because of the, because of the hardware. Um, but yeah, may, maybe there's like, uh, maybe there's an opportunity here for someone to figure out a better model, uh, especially for something that is so, seems like it should be a sort of public good like not only the civil resistant identity but also like the open source hardware it, it really feels like like it, it it exists in public good territory and so there and then in that case you know like what are the types of organizations that have money that are less incentivized by just purely returns but more incentivized by like the vision and like supporting the vision and the mission whether that's you know um like foundations in the crypto space or uh foundations or like nonprofits that uh you know help people be financially sovereign or like, I don't know, like um, this this sort of thing so maybe maybe there's a an interesting model here i i totally agree with all of what you're saying and it it will become a public good like that's the, that's the whole goal of what we're doing right um and i don't know like oh, oh, it would be amazing if people figure out other other methods but 
to to be honest, um, I don't know. It, it, it's kind of like an anti meme in the crypto space. I think we see at this point. But again, um, all of our investors are like I don't know. We selected them a lot. Like we, many many people, we did let in around and, and things like that. And the investors we have are very aligned with everything we're doing. And the only way they make money is that. The, the protocol actually works and the token increases in value. There is no there is no backdoor or something, so there are actually value land. And if you ever talk to Chris Dixon, you will understand why it's great to have someone like that with you. Um, and, and the same is true for many other investors we have. All right. So I think um, I I think it's actually wonderful that that exists. Like that you have like super super brilliant and smart people that thought about this space for many years, and um, they will go on board and help you, and and you you get funding from them. So. I, I, I get it's an anti-meme and I get where it's coming from, but um, I love our investors. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically I totally understand the need for funding. If you, if you look at coins that are meme coins, so basically coins that have no obvious utility, so say Bitcoin, I would also, I mean, Wildcoin is also a meme coin. So basically what's, what's the meme uh, for, for Wildcoin? <laughs> so, so, so j j j just to comment to that, right? Like, um, I mean, one way and certainly not a perfect way to measure it is the Gini coefficient, as, as you probably know. And there's like all kinds of literature why it's maybe not the perfect metrics, but it's at least it's some. And uh, like Bitcoin and, 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 and other projects are at 0 0.9, Vulcan will be at 0 0.4, um, something like that. So it's, it's much, much better. I don't know, like everyone gets ownership in, in this new thing. Everyone just simply for being a human just, no matter where you are you get ownership in something new that we all can create together and it's like a new playing field and that that's really really exciting i think to many people but, but you're creating value first and foremost so i mean yes i mean you're, you're positioning it as a as a public good um but you're creating value first and foremost for the people who've invested right i mean so basically the vcs they're in this um for the money, they're not in it to make the world a better place, right? So, um, if you if you give like um, the equivalent of what you'd give a billion and a half people to um, uh, to, to uh, five hundred people who funded you in 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 the beginning, doesn't that um, do you think that doesn't make it extremely unlikely that the remaining people will kind of um, uh, coordinate around that system rather than a system that doesn't have that right so basically if if you have the entire distribution of world coin and um, 20 and 20 percent um goes to the people who kind of um started it um or financed it in the beginning um don't you think this will be forked and i mean see i'd see where, where i where i'm coming from is that I don't see how this is how this is not going to irk people the wrong way. I, I think that's fair, but again, um, if people have ideas, other ideas, what we can do here, I will be the first one to talk about that. Like maybe there's even a way how we can issue like um, I don't know, like another another token with like different different rights or whatever. Like there, there's all kinds of things you can think about. We we, we had this discussion with Balaji actually recently, so I I, I totally get it. I think given the boundary constraints we had and we thought about this for like a lot of time and we just, you actually need money to make that work. I think it's the, yeah, it's the, it's the best end state um, that was achievable. Yeah, I'd like to talk about the, 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 the regulatory side a little bit. Um, so yeah, I mean, you're, you're aware of, of, of what happened in the fallout of Libra and that, that project uh, I think stirred uh, a lot of shit <laughs> To put things lightly, um, in terms of like regulatory awareness uh, around crypto and around these, you know, like kind of global currencies that might compete with national currencies. Um, what's the um, what, what do you feel is the state of things uh, in the jurisdictions that you have started sort of like launching the project, and are you um, are you concerned about Say regulators in Europe, for instance, you know, like uh, prohibiting these sorts of currencies from even existing, uh, as the uh, Mika regulation hints at and is accelerating, perhaps because of the Ukraine conflict. 
Yeah, I mean, of, of course we were concerned. Um, so level level one concern was certainly um, and is the United States, right? There was just a lot, lot of it, it's not even it's it, you're basically just flying blind, uh, as as I think you, you probably heard from many people. There's just a lot of regulatory uncertainty, and that's why we will not launch in the United States um, at, at least a token. You will you will be able to receive your your proof of personhood, uh, kind of your identity piece, but you will not receive the token. And also, the team is is located um, outside of the United States to a large degree. We, we we just we just don't know what what will happen there, and, and like many people also don't know that. I guess that's that's no surprise. So that is level one concern. Um, the European Union, as you just mentioned, like there there's recent developments that are also concerning. I think uh, particularly uh, the, the, the craziest thing that happened recently is, is kind of thinking about banning the, the uh, proof of proof of rock chains, which was just s scary to see. I was in the room with the people writing the paper refuting that thesis, so uh, or from that regulation. So yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, I'm I'm very much uh, close to the to the people that are doing the the hard work trying to not make make you know this regulation not go through. Yeah. Okay, so so you, you know much more more than me about this, but um, yeah, I mean we we think a lot about regulation. We have um, we have extremely talented people in our legal team thinking about that problem a lot. Um, but yeah, so so number one is we will launch not in the United States for exactly that reason. Uh, we will monitor the European Union. Uh, but but otherwise we, we will just comply wherever we go. We are ob also obviously like in a in a simpler situation than Libra. Yeah, yeah, it, it's unclear. I think at this point, and I think like the um, the the conflict in Ukraine will certainly uh, accelerate things on the regulatory front. I mean, I, I think just just uh, today, like uh, Christine Lagarde makes made some comments about how uh, we like really now need to regulate and like Mika needs to be fast tracked, and um, that will likely not be great for the industry, I presume. Um, so, like, what's your what's your goal here? Like, you know, if if Worldcoin succeeds, and you know, we fast forward twenty years from now. How will it have made the world a better place? It it will be a major public good that that the whole ecosystem is using to to solve civil resistance. It will have it will have been the, the biggest onboarding into Web three that the world has seen so far. I think that that's by far the most exciting thing for for all of us. That it will give people access to a system that otherwise um, would just take much much longer. I, I don't I don't think it would not happen, but we are just in a position to actually accelerate it, and we see that working. We actually see a path to go to a billion users in less than three years from now, um, and that was very, very surprising to us and, and, and crazy to us. Um, and yeah, it will be it will be something where where people can can try new things. Maybe UBI will come. I, I think like in, in in twenty years, the most exciting thing actually would be that that UBI is deployed at least to some subgroup of people or something with that, and um, everyone has access to a, a privacy preserving, scalable proof of personhood. There's like many many answers in there, but I think you get the point. So Alex, um, if you zoom out a bit, um, there's actually a couple of projects that um, are in, in a similar um, position in the Web3 ecosystem, right? So I'm thinking of things like um, the Good Dollar, Proof of Humanities, or Circles UBI. Um, how how do you see Wildcoin with respect to these? Well, first of all, I'm excited um, to, to see other people solving solving, I guess, one of the hardest hardest problems that there is in that space right so um i, I think it will be like ho hopefully just like a great coexistence where we're we will figure out different things at different times and can just adapt and learn really really fast um it's a way too big problem to be solved by one one project alone well i think it will be very surprising to um to people to see how fast it scales uh because there there is actually a like i, I think it will be at least double digit millions by the end of the year um so it, it will it will scale much much faster than people expect at this point that that's that's everything we, we measure internally and we're really surprised by so um so alex um i mean the 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 true test of time will be how many of these people will actually use their identity for anything right so basically because just because someone signs you up um doesn't mean you're an active participant in the network and you're actually using this for anything at all, right? So basically, when do you expect the network um, to be live, or when do you expect the when do you expect people um, to be able to interact with um, their 
with their identity. Well, I mean, we will we will open up the SDK and all of those things relatively soon. Um, so less less than three months. Uh, that part that parts will be open sourced and people can start building with it. And then I'm excited to see what what the community actually comes up with. Um, there are many interesting things going on here um, that will make it very different than what people are used to. So just just to give you one example, like one example is that those orbs lead to a very different network uh, distribution than normally because you basically have operators. You have talent operators that, that show up in front, uh, like in, in a certain city or geography, and then they, they get to high penetration really, really fast. So the density will be much, much higher um, com compared to other crypto networks. And that's what we already observe, right? So you basically, versus like a normal crypto network, um, at least like broadly speaking, ends up being widely distributed, like equally all over the world with people that are interested in it, what the Rollcon network will look like is you, you have clusters of like high penetration, um, double digit percentage penetration in like different locations, and then it starts it starts growing. Um, that will have many interesting implications. It will hard, hard to tell what, what that actually will do and what will people build with that. Um, but that was one thing that was very surprising to us. So in short, we are, we are like this, this identity part is a platform and uh, like we need a community to build things with that, of course. So we, we will open source it. We will we will grow it, and I think if it gets to a certain scale, uh, many people will build with it because it's just uh, you will have access to many many users and a lot of attention. So will you or your VCs um, actively incentivize the adoption um, through other projects? So basically, I mean, will you give out um, investments or grants to projects to actually use your SDK? Yeah, I think so. However, uh, I want to figure out a way how that it's also community governed, right? So that there's some some commu some um, some community fund or community grants, and uh, like it's it's getting relatively fast. The community actually decides what what to invest and what not. But but yeah, of course, it will happen. Where where does the community currently convene? So basically, if if um, our listeners want to get um, an idea of um, what the thoughts in the community are. Are there Telegram groups or Discord or wh wh where do they go to check this out? We, we are launching, so, so right now there's not much going on here. We just, we, we actually had to step from, from, from zero to one with all of the hardware and, and things like that. So relatively soon we, we open source the first parts of the system, launch, launch the Discord, the Telegram, all of those things and, and really involve the community in, in the most important decisions we're doing. And how can people um, stay up to date on this? Is there a mailing list that they can subscribe subscribe to, or follow you follow you on Twitter? Or what's what's the idea? Um, well, I think the best thing will be to join our Discord, and I, I think we will certainly also do a mailing list. All of, all of that stuff right now just doesn't exist. Um, we we have worked like really really hard over the last two months to just get get that hardware part off the ground, and now it's now it's there. So. The, the project will change um, very, very significantly in the, in the coming coming weeks, and I'm excited to, to, to tell you more and show you more. Cool. But it it really it really goes to kind of from now. Of course, we didn't talk much about it, and that that will change. So we'll talk much more about it. It will be open source, and and people can start building with us. I keep my eyes open uh, to see <laughs> where this is going. Very, very funny. <laughs> Thank you for coming up. <laughs> Thank you for coming on, Alex. <laughs> It's been a thanks pleasure. for having me. That was fun. Yeah, if, if if I could just like if I could just sum up here, like uh, so, I I feel like the, my 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 squeamishness around. Look, I mean, bottom line is like civil resistance. If if you if you if you figure out identity, you unlock a ton of use cases. And I mean, we've discussed this on the podcast at length with tons of people and. And that's an important component to unlocking like the full potential of crypto and like a world internet and like breaking down borders and what, you know, whatever you want. Like that's a big problem that needs to be solved. We talked about some other projects like proof of humanity and all these other things that are trying to do this in different ways. This is, I, I guess this is the, um, you know, the hardware option is a super efficient option, but it does come, I think with some, with some drawbacks, which like we, which we discussed earlier. And I think I've come away from this still squeamish about, um, getting my retina scanned to, um, 
to onboard the system, but confident that you guys will make the right decisions um, in order to make this as secure a system as possible. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's I think that's that's the takeaway from this from this conversation. I don't know, Federica, what do you think? Yeah, so basically my takeaway, I think, is, yeah, I think biometrics is somewhere I wouldn't go. To me, that's too invasive. And I think I've just, I, I've come away with this, with a renewed sense of that, you know, web of trust is the way to go. Because that's also, I mean, to me, that's the o the only way that I can see that this can um, scale um in a truly decentralized manner without being orchestrated. And I mean, you don't really want to have um, a conductor for this. Um, so yeah, to me, it's web of trust all the way. <laughs> well, that, 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 that would be cool. We just don't see it working yet. Uh, but of course, if that works, it would be awesome. And again, we're also working on this internally, but it's just, it doesn't work yet. And no one has seen it scale. All right, thanks for, thanks for having me. Thanks so much. <laughs>